Hello and welcome to my channel In Search of Wonder. My name is Anne and this is my weekly wrap up. Okay, as you can see, I am in cozy mode today. I am wearing a t-shirt, which I never do. And you can't see it, but I'm wearing leggings, which I also never do. And I'm wearing cozy socks, which I do when I'm home of an evening and I want to be cozy. And I'm all wrapped up in my cozy blanket and I've got some hot tea because two reasons. One, it is raining cats and dogs outside. Well, at the moment, I don't hear it, but it has been off and on <clears throat> most of the day. And two, I am on day four of being sick, but I am feeling much better right now. And on the upward swing here, I expect to go back to work tomorrow. And I'm honestly getting a little bored because I have been at home all day by myself. And, um, you know, I've done all of the sick person things, ate my chicken noodle soup, took a nap, rested, read quite a bit, that kind of stuff. Um, so now I'm going to film this. I'm pretend like I'm talking to someone to alleviate the dreadful boredom of recovering from being sick. So, um, I <clears throat> spent a lot of time the past few days lying around and doing nothing besides watching stuff and reading books and sleeping. So I have several books to share with you that I have finished reading. First of all, I mentioned in my last week's weekly wrap up that for my um, anniversary weekend, <laughs> which ended up to be not much of an anniversary weekend because first my husband was sick and then I was sick. So, you know, we're going to do a little rain check on that. Um, but I wanted to read um, a ram romance novel in honor of the occasion. And so I read um, A Lady's Guide to Fortune Hunting by Sophie Irwin. And of all of the Regency novels that I have read recently, this one rises to the top like cream. It was very good. It was very cleverly written. Um, very humorous, um, definitely some nods to Georgette Hare in the writing style and in the characters and in some aspects of the plot. Um, Sophie Irwin was, has clearly read Georgia Hare and was inspired by her, if nothing less, um, if nothing else. Yeah, if nothing else. Uh, so it was very clever, the story, um, it's, I guess, a little bit of a twist on on um, the fortune hunting marriage plot because the girl is a, um, a determined fortune hunter. Uh, but to make the story palatable and to make her likable, she has a real need, a genuine need. She has uh, four sisters that she's responsible for, her parents having kind of left her um, in the lurch financially they've passed on and um did not leave provision for their kids um they do own their home but it was mortgaged and so she has debts she has to pay or the house will be um wow the language is not coming the house will be like essentially foreclosed like they didn't use that language but that's the idea and so um you know back in that day it's, this is this isn't that preposterous of a storyline because um, back in that day, women of a certain class, uh, actually really women, women of, of every class, I think, really, unless they were independently wealthy, um, f for whatever reason, they, um, really depended on men for their financial stability. And, uh, so she had no way of procuring enough money to support her entire family. You know, like she and her other oldest sibling or two could have supported themselves, but they could not have supported the whole family. They could not have afforded to keep the home, whatever. So she has good, good reasons for being a fortune hunter. And she goes off to London to seek her fortune, i.e. find a wealthy husband. Um, and she's just so delightfully mercenary about it, which those two words don't normally go together, delightful and mercenary, but it's, it's written charmingly to make it so. And so she has it nailed down to how many pounds per year of income her husband needs to have. And, um, yeah, and she goes about, you know, meeting these gentlemen and, um, 
she comes across this one really rich young man um, who is the second son. So he's not heir to a title. Um, and he's just very naive. He's very much, he's very much a younger brother character like you would meet in a Georgia Hare book. And he, he's just very naive and trusting and, um, just falls head over heels in love with her. Like he's infatuated with her. And so she manipulates that for all that she's worth because she wants his fortune and he's a nice enough kid, but he's definitely very childish and immature and obviously not a good match for her. And um, she also charms his mother into accepting her, even though she has no fortune or connections or anything. Then it manages to weasel her way into high society, even though she has, you know, no, no real standing for being in high society. And anyway, there is a twist to the story. And um, the brother, the, the heir to the earldom, I think it is, um, he recognizes that she is up to no good. And so he steps in to save his family from her machinations. Is that his other word? Machinations. 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 That word. Anyway. He sees what's up. And so he makes a deal with her to keep her away from his brother. But it doesn't keep her away from him. And so that's where the real story starts. Anyways, it was funny. Definitely gave me great Georgette hair vibes. And I enjoyed it very much. And also, perfectly clean. There's like, I, I think they may even have one like little tiny kiss somewhere in there. Um, yeah. And I don't remember any cussing at all. I suppose there could be, but I don't remember any. Um, and also, can I just say, I loved the, obviously you can't tell, but I just, I loved the feel of this book and the way the pages turn. Like the pages are so light and they just turn so nicely and it lays so nicely. Like this was a really nice quality paperback. Um, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I guess probably four stars overall for this one. It was very good. And then when I was lying sick in bed, I was like, you know what? I have read all of my February books for my February TBR. Yay me. And as of that day, it was only like February 26th or 27th. And I was like, I can um, jump in and join uh, in with the February challenge, which I had wanted to. It's, um, I know that, um, Taylor at Tales and Trees with Tays and I forget who else. There were several hosts of it. I will remember who they are and I'll put them in the description box, but they, um, hosted this reading challenge, which I did not initially commit to doing because I, I try to stick to one big challenge or readathon every month. And for February, for me, that was Feb Regency. Um, but I was very, um, interested in this readathon that they were doing, which was to read various fairy tale retellings, etc. And they had a bunch of prompts. Um, <clears throat> and I think, I don't know if this fits any, I can't remember right now what the prompts are. So I don't know if this book fits any, but at any rate, I was lying there in bed and I was like, oh, you know, I can, this would be the perfect time to fit in a book for the February challenge, the, the February challenge. So I read um, Karen Whitmire's Fairest of Heart, which is Snow White set in Texas. I really enjoy um, Karen Wetmeyer's books. She writes um, uh, rom-coms, historic fiction rom-coms, um, set usually in like Texas or um, somewhere out west, and um, usually all like in the 1800s at some point. Um, so they're always um, fun reads and um, they always have great heroes and um, heroines, plucky heroines. And um, anyway, so I really love Karen Whitmire. But when I saw this series that she was doing these fairy tale retellings, I was a little like, hmm, how is that going to mix a fairy tale in Texas? Like, 
I don't know. I was skeptical. I was skeptical. But people raved about this and they really loved it. So, um, and I do like Karen Whitmire normally, so I figured, why not? Let's give it a try. And I got it from my library, um, the Hoopla, on the Hoopla app. So I checked it out and I read it and I read it like, being sick notwithstanding, I read it like within a day and a half. <clears throat> and it was, it was very, okay, at the risk of overusing this word in this video, charming, <laughs> delightful. Um, it really, it worked. I mean, you wouldn't think that Snow White and now it's been a long time since I have read the original Snow White fairy tale. Um, I'm going to have to, in the month of March, I'm going to be, um, reading Grimm's fairy tales. So that's definitely one that I'm going to read so I can remember how the original goes, but I feel like she's definitely playing off the Disney version here. So, and I'm not sure how much the Disney version sticks to the, um, the original. Uh, anyway, so you have all of the characters from the Disney version, um, but they are um, put in, you know, the context of, of Texas um, back in the 18 something or others. And so um, you've got Penelope Snow as the heroine, who who is um, frankly a little bit saccharine that would be my only complaint, but at the same time, I can't complain because she's working within a framework and that's the framework. So that's the character of Snow White. So if she had written her otherwise, she wouldn't have been doing the same thing. So um, I can't complain about it. But Penelope Snow is, is an unbelievably sweet and generous and kind-hearted and joyful young lady, very much like in the Snow White movie. And then um, <clears throat> the, um, and she's, you know, she's an orphan and she has no one to take care of her and she's beautiful and she's thrust out into the world on her own. And um, her her boss is the, um, I, I forget who the villain is in Snow White, her relationship to Snow White. Was she, like she has a queen or something. Um, was Snow White her daughter or her stepdaughter or I'm not really sure or just like the queen. Anyway, it's her boss as the book starts. Um, but she becomes jealous of her beauty and so, you know, um, has her little henchman um, kill her. But of course, the henchman um, who is kind of in love with the boss, he uh, doesn't. He gives her an opportunity to save herself. And then the hero of the story um, is a Texas Ranger, of course, which was a fun twist and um, a really good honorable guy. And he has it. What um, what maybe deviates uh, if she deviates from the storyline at all, as it was given to her to work with, you know, what the framework she was working with, she develops the hero's character a lot more, which is good because in the movie, like you don't really know much about the prince. And, you know, it's just the fact that he's a prince, right? I'm not complaining about that. I don't even necessarily see that as a flaw. But in, in this book, Karen Whitmire definitely fleshes out his character, gives him more of a backstory, and um, definitely makes him a character that you're much more invested in. And I feel like she really did a good job with his character. And then, of course, you're wondering, what about the Seven Dwarves? Well, they're not dwarves in this story. They're seven old men. And they live on, on this ranch, the Diamond D Mine, um, that was started by Doc, who is our hero's grandfather. And it is like a retirement home for old ranch hands who would otherwise be, you know, have no means to take care of themselves, but they're, you know, too old to really, um, and do the physical work necessary of being a ranch hand. So um, they live a kind of like, um, it's kind of like a, like a homesteading sort of thing where they raise and collect all of their own food and they they have honey, they, they have um, um, <laughs> beehives and so they, they earn money with by making honey and some other things, whatever. It's really a cool concept. Um, I hope that there really is or was a, 
a sort of thing like that because it was really cool. Anyway, so these these seven old men and they they definitely all had like you know there's a sneezy one and there's a sleepy one and there's a grumpy one, etc. And um, so they um, Penelope Snow ends up at this ranch and they take care of her and they really become like an army of grandfathers for her and that was just really so sweet um that part of the story um you know when it when you think about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves um <clears throat> it's you know like a fun story but then when it's put in this context which makes it seem so much more realistic and um real with real relationships anyway it's more, much more meaningful and it's actually a really beautiful part of the story and I really love that and um the the tenderness and the protectiveness which with with which they took care of um Penelope Snow our heroine um I actually brought tears to my eyes more than once so um anyway I really enjoyed it so much uh it was fantastic so I think I gave it four four and a half stars um, very good. I really enjoyed that. Um, then I finished Gentle and Lowly by Dane Ortland, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. And this book just did not let up on the good news. How can you not when you're talking about Christ and his, his heart of love for sinners? Um, so good. Um, I just, I highlighted so many things and I, put so many tabs in here. Um, I really, I wish that everybody could read this. It's just musings on the heart of Christ or, um, you know, one man's thoughts on it. Um, he is digging into scripture passages. Each chapter is based on a particular scripture and he looks at it in context and he also compares it to other scripture um, and, and against scripture as a whole. Um, so that nothing is taken out of context, so which is really important. Um, and he is just like meditating on the truth of each scripture as it reveals God's heart and therefore Christ's heart for us as sinners. And it's just so beautiful. And I think I, I have long thought that if I could just grasp the love of Christ, uh, because the Bible says um, we love him because he first loved us. Like, if I could just grasp how much Christ loves me, like, if I could just understand that, then it would, it would transform me and my life because I feel like I would have no reason, no, no response but to love him in return. Now, that has mentally been my thought because mentally I know and understand how loving Christ is, but it's, it's the living in that. It's it's the really understanding that um, that's difficult for us as humans because, as he says in one of the chapters, God's ways are not our ways. And in particular, when it comes to love, we don't love like Christ. So we have difficulty understanding his love because we don't have a context for it because, no, because we don't love like that. We love selfishly. And it's hard for us to understand the selflessness of, of God's love. So I think it's really important to read books like this and to meditate on passages of scripture to really just retrain our brain and recalibrate. Um, and I feel like it's the, the most fundamental aspect of God's character that <clears throat> we need to grasp in order to have victory in life and in our Christian life because like I said I feel like if we really knew how much God loved us and if we lived and walked in that love then we wouldn't ever have any reason to go anywhere else for any other reason like for we wouldn't want to pursue anything else because it would be everything that we needed so I really enjoyed this very much. I highly recommend it for every believer. Um, it's not a one-sided look at these qualities of Christ. I mean, it's, it's focusing on um, Christ's heart of love and his mercy and his grace, etc. But not at 
the expense of his of his justice and um, his wrath and his um I, I don't know how to put this I don't know, hatred of sin or I don't, I don't know the right word for it I don't know he's just you know obviously against sin in any form it's it's focusing on those aspects of, of God and his um, attributes but it's it's a more holistic look at the character of, of God and at the love of God and the reasons for it and um, it doesn't negate sin or make it um, of less importance than it is in the story of the gospel which is is where many people in our in in modern Christianity where we err sometimes um, because we have a tendency to emphasize the love of Christ but without without speaking about what it is that makes Christ's love so great for us and which he talks about a lot in this book and that is um, our sin it's what's so amazing is that Christ loves us is because he loved us while we were yet sinners and it, the the magnitude of his mercy and his grace is is seen when you have a complete understanding of your sin if you don't have a complete understanding of your sin and your sinfulness then you will not have a complete understanding of the mercy and the grace and the love of god so there has to be in order to understand how much christ loves you first you have to understand how sinful you are because then you won't be able to understand the love that he has for you um and that's one of the key elements of this of this book so um, it's kind of addressed to people who, it, it's addressed to Christians. So, you know, it's addressed to people who um, already theoretically can see that and maybe struggle under the weight of their sin and, um, you know, wanting reassurance about that. Um, so in, anyway, in that way, it's really good. And I feel like I've been just kind of like speaking very haltingly, but I'm not able to, to put my, my thoughts into <laughs> coherent sentences. So um, I apologize, but... It was very good, and I highly recommend this book. Every believer, if you have not read this yet, please read it. And um, if you have read it, maybe it's time for a reread. Um, it was so good. I definitely will be rereading this again at some point. And I gave this five stars, and I think this may be the only book that I gave five stars of my February reading. So that's what I have read so far this week. I have started on my... Um, Little Gray March reading with Peter Nimble and his fantastic eyes and um, my son finished it we're not even in March guys but uh, <laughs> he finished it the other day and brought it to me and um, I think he enjoyed it um, he liked it well enough I don't think it ranks as a favorite book for him he said it was pretty good um, so anyway I'm enjoying the the prose so far the narrative style is is very interesting it, it kind of evokes classic children's book but without being um stuffy or pretentious or um unnaturally so and it has enough um modern aspect to it that it's you know still like fresh and um there's a bit of of, of irony of course in the narrative um which i find a little bit amusing and um, the only thing so far that I'm not loving is, which I guess I should have figured out by the title, but, uh, so I have this squeamish thing about eyes. Ugh. Um, I have a few things that make me squeamish. Um, one is needles. I can't get my blood drawn to save my life. And literally my veins hide when the needle comes running. Like, seriously and it just makes it so much worse like they can't find my veins and anyway I really I hate needles they make me squeamish I hate any conversation about internal workings of the body at all I would make a horrible nurse or doctor even though I'm actually interested in health and um healing modalities um but yeah I I can't handle too much conversation about not necessarily inner workings of the body but when things go wrong and um yeah can't handle too much conversation about that it makes me feel very faint and like if someone else is in extreme pain I can't handle it it makes me nauseous and woozy and okay here's the other thing eyeballs I can't handle 
eyeball conversation or like close-ups of eyeballs. No, no, I don't, I can't, no. I don't like it. I'm so far, there's been a decent amount of that in this book. And um, personally for me, it's a little cringy. So I am struggling through that aspect. Um, and unfortunately, I think it's a big part of this story. But so far, I'm trying to grin and bear it because otherwise, you know, I feel like there is great quality to this story and it's interesting and the things are happening, you know, it's interesting. It's definitely fast paced and keeps me moving, but the eyeball thing, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I can do it. So we'll see. Um, yeah, and my son last night was, oh my goodness, he was trying to say something about, um, oh, okay. So, <laughs> so this is a bit of a, wow, okay, this is a bit of a rabbit trail because um, I'm going to have to start back a little bit. I found this meme and I sent it to my son. So it was basically correlating the ancient cultures and cities to modern teenage high school personalities, stereotypes. And it was actually pretty funny. And I sent it to my son and I asked him if it was true. So he was talking to me about it and we were, you know, talking through the ancient cultures and their characteristics or whatever. And he was like, yeah, the Assyrians, which I think that they were on the Goth side, he was like, yeah, they were nasty. And he was like, they were the ones who conquered northern Israel, the northern kingdom in Israel, and they have really creative ways of torturing. And um, he's like, he, he was trying to remember the specific ways that they had tortured the kings of Israel. He's like, they did some really interesting things to them. He's like saying they're trying to remember. And I'm just like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I, I've been reading about, you know, I've been reading in Second Chronicles and stuff lately in the Bible. And there's a lot of things that make me wince in, in there. I was like, but I can't remember specifically what the things that were mentioned. He's like, yeah, I think the Bible says specifically some of the things that they did. I'm like, yeah, I'm sure it does. I think I probably tend to gloss over those things because I don't want to dwell on it too much. And He's like, oh yeah. He's like, I'm pretty sure that they gouged their eyes out. I'm like, okay, thank you. That's very nice. And then my son, he goes on to say, he's like, actually, I feel like it would be pretty easy to gouge someone's eyes out. He's like, I think you just need a spoon. Son. I don't know where he came from. I don't know what's wrong with him. Ah. <sighs> Yes, teenage boy. So anyways, uh, on that pleasant note, I will sign off for now. And if I read anything else this week, I will make another clip. <laughs> In the meantime, bye. And I'll see you next time.